uh, turn, with me, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. This week, uh, as Dad was saying last week, we've been going through a series on the Holy Spirit. Who is this Holy Spirit? What does He do? Why do we need Him? Um, and so today, we're going to talk about a story of transformation. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, talk this morning and, and look at you know, why do we need the Holy Spirit? What difference does the Holy Spirit make in somebody's life? And I think it makes all the difference. I think as believers, uh, the sometimes the Holy Spirit is like this forgotten member of the Trinity. You know, at Father, Son, we really you know, pray to the Father through the Son. And then the Holy Spirit sometimes is tapped on there extra. But the Holy Spirit is essential as a believer to living a life like Jesus did. So um, let's turn to Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to read um, Peter's address. And this is a... a maybe 30 verses here, but this one is set the stage for all of what we talked about this morning. Let's read this morning if you have your Bible with me. Um, we're in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 14. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. My fellow Jews, and all who are living in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what is spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Desert, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of the wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at the right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me. To the realm of the dead, you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Amen. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and knew God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God had raised this Jesus to life, and we are all his witnesses. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Lord, Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said, Peter and the apostles, Brother, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from these corrupt generations. Those who accepted this message were baptized, and 3,000 were added to their number that day. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I, 
I thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit, that your Spirit is one that reveals truth to us. So I ask that as I, the words that I speak today would not come only from my own understanding, but that you, Holy Spirit, would speak through me, and that these words, Father, would penetrate our hearts and transform us, that we may, we may look more and more like you. We thank you for these things, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So in John chapter 16, uh, verses 7 and 8, Jesus said this statement, and I can only imagine being with the disciples, having walked with Jesus, seeing the miracles that he did, um, performing uh, multitudes of food. Last night, we didn't need any multiplication of food. Actually, we had more than enough food last night. But I can only imagine being there with Jesus and seeing the, the fish and the loaves being broken, fitting with that 5,000 seeing the leopards being cleansed, the, the uh, blind people being able to see, seeing the dead being raised. It was pretty, some pretty amazing miracles that the disciples were able to witness. See the way that Jesus taught and he spoke, and when he was speaking, he spoke with such authority. The teachers mentioned that a few different times. And then in John chapter 16, verse 7 and 8, Jesus says this statement, and I could only imagine being in that room, but Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go away. Like, you know, I'm like, if I had, if I had superhuman power, you know, if I had Superman with me all the time, you know, like, it would be really, I would, I would like him with me. Jesus, I don't really want you to go away. I'm enjoying your presence. It's really amazing. I mean, think about his presence, right? It's, you are, you are too good, God. And he said, no, actually, it's for my advantage I go away. Because if I don't go away, what, he says, that unless I go away, the helper, the counselor, the advocate will not come. Uh, if we, as we've been studying through this, that in the chapters, John of John chapter 14 and 16, talks about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is going to be here, he's going to be our helper, uh, that was the first um, sermon that we talked about, he's going to be a helper, he's going to be alongside, he's going to help me through the way, but I really love, let's turn there real quick, uh, John chapter 16, there's one verse in particular that, that I get excited about when I, when I talk about the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, verse 12 and 13, it says this, I have, this is Jesus talking, he says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear now. But when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. I love this verse 12 for me, like I mentioned before, I have it, I can have this huge imagination, but Jesus makes these, these words that he says, he says, I have much more to that I want to say to you. Oh, that's really awesome. And who's going to be the one that reveals this truth to us? Who's going to be the one that reveals the much more to you? The Holy Spirit. So Jesus has a necessity. He says, I must go to the Father, and when I go, the Holy Spirit will come to you, and He will say to you much more. He will reveal to you much more truth about who I am and who the Father is. He's only going to speak, either the Holy Spirit's only going to speak what the Father has said. He's only going to speak the truth. He's only going to reveal the truth. But He's going to be one who's going to speak to us. And we're going to find out today, He's going to speak through us the truth. So if we've been baptized into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the, the, the words there we know are not just a statement of, of personhood, the identity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but also their very identity. So we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit is the one that is the one that proclaims truth, that reveals to all things, we as the children of God who have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, our identity now takes on the same as the Holy Spirit, that we become proclaimers of truth, ones that speak truth in every situation. In Luke chapter um, 12, verse 11 and 12, Jesus says this to the disciples, he says, when you're brought before the rulers and the authorities, don't worry what you will say. The Holy Spirit will teach you at that very moment what you should say. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit has in this aspect, and we're going to look a little bit even through the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit, whenever the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, he would come upon people, there was always a vocal thing that they, they, they were able to lead, they were able to be artistic, they were able to express. There was things that came forth from them as the Holy Spirit came upon them. We know this from last week's sermon, that now that Jesus has come to the Father, and, he, and those of us that have received Jesus, we have, 
Then we have the seal of the Holy Spirit. Remember the um, Jesus breathed on the disciples the Holy Spirit, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And they have peace. They have a security in their salvation now that the Holy Spirit is in them. But we're going to look a little bit further today that it isn't just this security, this deposit, this um, seal for our salvation, but it's also a release of our ability to speak forth what Jesus spoke and said and revealed to us. So let's look, uh, I want to go through, and you can maybe, if you're taking notes, you can take these notes. Um, there's a list, there's like a two page, I didn't co I copy all of them down, but there's at least three pages of people in the Old Testament alone that the Holy Spirit came upon and then something, they did something for God. The Holy Spirit came upon them and maybe they spoke something, they prophesied, maybe they did something. Maybe. So I, I have a, a little bit of a list here just to give us a taste that when the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, He enables us, He empowers us to do something, to speak something, to um, create something, just as the voice of the Lord does in creation of the universe. So the first one I mentioned, or I saw in Exodus chapter 35, verse 30 through um, 36, that the, the artists, the craftsmen, the ones that crafted and made the tabernacle and the holy place, the place where Jesus where the Spirit of God rested, they were all filled with the Spirit. It says, out of the filling of the Spirit, they created, they designed things. They were able to do and follow all the instructions that God had given them under the influence of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 12, it says David. We know King David, man after God's own heart. But he was able to, again, design things, design things tabernacle and receive from God and, and speak for God, all enabled by the Holy Spirit. That's 1 Chronicles 28, 12. And then we see Joseph. I love Joseph. Joseph was actually uh, was the first, I think, Halloween or Harvest Festival costume I ever um, wore. So when we were in Okinawa, Japan, uh, we had a costume party as part of the church outreach. And I was, I was Joseph, so mom made me a coat of many colors and I wore that, and I won that day. It was really great. But Joseph was a, was a man that um, he had dreams and he had visions. He was sent in um, his brothers. He sold them to slavery. God was able to use them to interpret dreams. But in um, Genesis chapter, I think I forgot the reference wrong. In Genesis chapter 41, verse 38, it says that the king, he recognized Joseph as one that was full of the Spirit. That the, the way that he was able to interpret these dreams, the way that he was able to um, do those things, he recognized, it was recognized about him, he was one that's full of the Holy Spirit. And we also see Moses and his 70 elders. Remember, Moses was trying to do everything on his own, and his stepfather said, hey, you've got to actually divide the people, and it would be easier for you to manage all these people if you didn't have to be the one that answered all these questions all day long. He had 70 elders. And there's a moment in Numbers, chapter 11, through um, 25, actually, the whole story, that 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 17, that the Spirit of God was upon Moses, and when he when he established these seventy elders, he also prayed that they would be uh, that the Spirit of God would be upon them. And it says that the Spirit of God came upon them, and they would receive wisdom in order to counsel the different people that were coming to them with their issues. We continue, and we see Joshua, Joshua in Deuteronomy uh, thirty-four verse nine was full of the Spirit. Saul. A, a, a king, the first king of um, Israel, it says that he prophesied by the Spirit. So the Spirit of God came on him, and he, pro he was able to prophesy. That's in First Samuel, chapter ten, verse six and seven. This is a neat name I was looking through, and I was like, wow, this is another name I don't even recognize or haven't really. Uh, not, a, I'm sorry, not a common character that we bring up, but there is a, a judge called Ethanel. And the Spirit of God came up upon him so that he was able to rule the people of Israel. He was able to lead them and guide them into, um, into the right things. That's in Judges uh, chapter 3, verse 10. Gideon. I love the story of Gideon. Because sometimes I find myself in Gideon's shoes. 
big war happening, there's the enemy coming against them, and where is Gideon? Gideon's hiding in the wine press. From the enemy. He's like this scared dude. Right? And what is it? And then the Spirit of God comes to him, the Spirit of God comes to him and he speaks to him. What, is, what does he say? Mighty warrior. Like, I could I would be just like Gideon sometimes when I hear the voice of God speaking to me, and I'm like, you sure you're talking to me? Like <laughs> I'm the only one here. But the Spirit of God then comes upon Gideon and he's able to take care of the army. He's able to be, lead the army and he, you know, that he gets an army and then it's, it's too, God says, no, the army that you have, actually it's in, uh, in the natural, it was too small already. And God said, actually your army's too big, so go take them down to the river. You guys, I know, remember this? And some of them drink a cup of some of them look and they, uh, while they're drinking, they're looking up, and then he dwindles the army down again. But the spirit, he says, that whole um, story, it says that Gideon was able to do these things because the spirit of God was upon him. Judges 6, verse 4, 34. Elijah and Elisha, two great prophets, two powerful prophets in the Old Testament. They were able to do what they were able to do because they rested, because the spirit of God rested on them. That's in, in first and second king. Then we have all the prophets. You can, you can read through the Old Testament, and you got you know Isaiah and Ezekiel, and we got Daniel and, and Micah, and there's some other names that um, are smaller, like Zechariah, and all of those prophets. It said that the, there was moments when the Spirit of God came upon them, and they began to speak. They were able to speak boldly to the kings of their time and direct them what the Spirit of God was telling them to do. So we get back to these New Testament moment when Jesus says to his disciples, it's going to be advantageous for your event that I go, because unless I go, the Holy Spirit is not going to be able to come. But when I go, he's coming. He's going to come when I leave. So what happened? What's, the, what's this revelation that we have in the New Testament of the Holy Spirit? The revelation that we have of the, of the um, Holy Spirit in the New Testament is that when Jesus has come and he's completed the work, he went and died on the cross, and in the moment of his dying on the cross, it said that the, the veil was torn in the temple. So once the Spirit, he would come upon people in the Old Testament, and he would leave. But the, he rested in the temple. Now that Jesus is, is raised, and, and now that the blood of Jesus has been placed upon us, now the Holy Spirit resides in us. We learned that last week. So what is Revelation now? Let's turn to Acts chapter 1. The Holy Spirit was always in the, in the, um, was always in the business, I guess. His MO was always empowering people to do something. Mm -hmm. So in Acts chapter 1, it reveals, now that it was Jesus before he's ascending into heaven, he tells his disciples, you, you have to wait, you gotta, you, you must wait, because the Holy Spirit's gonna come. In Acts 1, this is what he says, in Acts 1, verse 7 and 8, the disciples again are asking when he's going to restore the kingdom of God. And he says this, It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has sent by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. You'll be my witnesses. You'll be empowered. You'll, the power that you have will enable you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to the end of the earth. The Holy Spirit in the, in the New Testament, He is a revealer of truth. He reveals all things to us and then enables us, empowers us to be that same, uh, to have that same amount, to have that same identity, to be one who reveals truth, who speak truth, who speak of the great things of God to others, to be His witnesses. Witnesses require not only to be able to see something, so that's the first part of the Holy Spirit. He reveals things to us, so we see something. But then the second part enables us to speak something, to share with the things that we have seen and heard of God. So what difference does it make? Why, why answer what I need? Why did we do a whole series on the Holy Spirit? Why do I need the Holy Spirit? Well, I'm gonna, we're going to examine the story of, uh, of Peter. Peter's one of Jesus' disciples. 
And I love Peter, because sometimes I have the same issue. I remember when I was um, younger, we would, growing up, and um, I would say something that's really, I thought was really true about somebody or a situation, and mom would sometimes correct me and say, well, Andrew, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. And, you, and sometimes my response would be, well, but at least I'm saying the truth. Like, I, you know, Peter was one of these people that when he spoke, I, uh, he, he needed a guard. I, I call it sometimes, I say Peter had a, a foot and mouth disease. So he, whenever he would open his mouth, he, maybe you guys have heard that joke, you know, you open mouth, insert foot. He, sometimes he would just speak what's on his mind. And many times, as we go to look, he gives things a little off. Sometimes he gives it really great. And then right after that, he has the open mouth, insert foot moment. It really, it really, um, I mean, character. Sometimes I can relate to Peter. So let's look at a few um, instances here of Peter, pre-Holy Spirit coming upon him. All right, we're going to Matthew chapter 14. Another uh, inside joke I had with my my grandma, the first time or one of the times of, uh, when I came up to Wisconsin, we visited and came during winter time. We were living in North Carolina, so North Carolina the temperatures high enough we'd never seen solid uh, a, a solid ice lake. Right, the lake is iced over. Um, so I was talking to my grandma the first time we, we visited her during winter time, and we went out to the lake and we could like walk on the lake. Look, Grandma, I'm walking on water. And he's like, You're not Jesus, Andy. And I, but, um, so Matthew 14, we know is this, this passage of, of Jesus. He's, uh, he tells his disciples to go to the other side of the lake. He goes up and prays with the Father. And he ends up walking out to the disciples while they're in the sea. So we got this instance, Jesus walking by. The disciples actually get kind of scared. They're thinking maybe there's some spirit, some ghost out there. And we get Peter. I love Peter. So, um, and Peter, let's look at this, John chapter, I mean, Matthew chapter 14. One more page over. So, verse 25. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and he cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, and this is Peter, now this is David. Lord, if it's you, command me to come out to you in the water. I like that. Just be bold. Just do it. He gets out on the water. So, of course, Jesus says, Come. Then Peter got down on the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? Fear still grips Peter's heart. As he sees, he sees the Lord walking on the water, he calls out to him, man, if that's you, let me come out. And he gets out on the water. And he actually, you know, there's a moment here, Peter is actually walking on water also with the Lord. And then fear grips his heart, he loses sight, and calls out to the Lord, and he saves him. <laughs> Peter is a bold dude, but still ravished by fear. In Matthew chapter 15, um, starting in verse 15, this is really neat. Jesus is, is saying this disciple, uh, telling this parable to the disciples, and he's talking specifically about what defiles a person. Is it what enters a man that defiles them? Or what comes out of a man that defiles him. And Jesus says this very plainly. Let's turn. Matthew chapter 15. We're going to right into uh, 15. Uh, sorry, verse 13. He says it pretty plainly. It spells this out for the, for the disciples. He said, you're like, Every plant my heavenly Father has not, uh, has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them... They are blind guides. If they blind, if the blind is the blind, both will fall into a pit. In verse ten, it was is the one that says that 
what it, not what goes into somebody's mouth that defiles them, but what comes out of their mouth that defiles them. So I can understand this in the Jewish culture. They it was really particular about what they touch, what they eat, and those kind of things. So that when she does make these statements, it's pretty radical for Peter and the other disciples to to get this, to understand this. They're still trying to wrap their mind around uh, Jesus and his teachings that seem really odd to them. But on the other side of things, as I as I research this, is Jesus talked in pretty plain language. That it's not what it's not what you eat, it's what what comes out. Jesus is, says that the fathers are going to take those that are um, not the plant is going to uproot them; they're going to be taken out. And Peter Peter then goes, "Can you explain this to me, Jesus, a little bit more? Like, it makes it a little bit more clear to me." <laughs> yeah. I can only I mean I, I sometimes like I'm, I'm teaching I. I I'm on campus a little bit with some students and help them understand Jesus, and I, I think I make something really, really clear to them. And maybe I've not, I've not um, had the blessing yet of being a parent. But maybe you, as a parent, have experienced this. You say something and you spell it out pretty clearly to your children, and then all of a sudden they, are you? Can you explain that to me? I don't. I didn't quite get that. This is Jesus' response to him. Are you still dull, Peter? That's pretty harsh rebuke to me. I, are you still dull? Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth doesn't uh, it goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth are from the heart, and this defiles them. I mean, he repeats the exact same thing he did five verses before. Peter is got to, he he has some issues sometimes. All right, we're going to find a, a couple more issues. So. Um, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 17. Matthew chapter 16. This is one of, maybe, maybe uh, this is the moment where Peter gets a gold star. Um, but in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi. He asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say you're John the Baptist, others say you're Elisha, and still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. What do you say? Golden star moment for Peter. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh or blood, but by the Father in heaven. And I tell you that you, Peter, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Peter Goldstar moment. Okay, who does people say you are? And he receives a revelation from the Father and speaks that you are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. Way to go, Peter. You can get re revelation from me. What happens right after this? The next, the very next thing after this. Verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things, that the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teacher of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day, be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. You know, sometimes I... Sometimes when I'm, I, I know these moments when I'm in tune with the Spirit and I speak something, there's a moment that you can tell I'm speaking something and, and, I, and the Spirit of God is on me. Maybe like last night I had an instance I was talking with one of the um, one of my neighbors that came to the dinner and there was just this moment where like yeah, what I'm saying is exactly what they need and I knew it was from from the Father, I knew it was from the Spirit of God. And then there's a lot of other times I have like Peter where I just like I just go out there. God's plays and just speak it. Rebuking the Lord. Never what happened to you. And Jesus replies to him, get, me behind, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have the mind that concerns of God, but merely human concern. Why do I need the Holy Spirit? I mean, let's be honest. I need the Holy Spirit because sometimes my mind is still in the flesh. It's still what I desire. It's still what I want. And I don't want, Jesus, I don't want you to die. I want you to leave. Come on, I need you. I want this. This is the best thing for me. The Spirit of God does something and he radically changes 
who Peter was. But if we do think this, this is worth enough, there's another foot and mouth kind of moment where Jesus tells the, is that the disciples in Matthew 26? We're going to go a little closer to the end. And he's having the Last Supper with the disciples, and he predicts that there's going to be somebody here that's going to deny me. Peter, this is, I mean, this is Peter's perfect moment to like to speak up again. Like this is, this is not going to happen. Peter's like, no, there's no way I would deny you. Right? So now actually, he kind of denied me three times before the rooster crowed. And so we find in, in verse 69 through 75 of the story that we find Peter just one on one hand. I mean, not afraid to speak, not afraid to jump out of the boat. Not, I mean, just I'm going to rebuke Jesus. I'm going to do. I'm going to just speak in my own accord in front of servant girls, not even able to identify himself with Jesus. So we open this morning with Acts chapter two. Let's go back. When Jesus said, you must wait, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and you're going to receive power to be my witnesses. He spoke in Luke to this out of the four. When you go before authority, when you go before people, don't worry what you're going to say. Open your mouth and as you speak, the, the, the Spirit of God is going to give you the words to speak. He's going to teach you as you speak. But Acts chapter 2 is this moment. And I love... God is really, I, I use this word maybe too much, but God is really awesome. I love the way God puts things together. You know, not only when we think about creation and he knits together all of us and he knits us together in his mother, but when we speak about creation and he created all these unique designs and, and put everything in order in such a way that everything is, is fine-tuned to the point where life is, is, is able to happen. I mean, God is so detailed in everything. And in sending the Holy Spirit... He was extremely detailed in this moment. Because when the Holy Spirit comes, Acts chapter 2, this is a celebration of Pentecost. I love talking about the Holy Spirit so much because when we talk about Pentecost, we talk about a, a, a festival of celebrating the harvest. I mean, I love Jesus' word. This is like so many things. I'm not even having to note a little bit, but, but where Jesus proclaims the disciples and he says, he tells them to go look to the, the harvest. The harvest is plentiful, right? Again, this day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God comes, the one that enables us to be His uh, to be His witnesses, to give us power to speak truth to people, happens on the day of harvest. I love it because in my mind it, it, it marries the picture of the Holy Spirit coming and its purpose. Without without understanding his purpose, I think it's just it can be just a, a, a good gift that we celebrate together in a closed door behind uh, where nobody else is. You know, and uh, if we oh, if we don't remember the purpose, if we don't remember the happening. Then on a Sunday morning when we gather together, we can express the gifts of the Holy Spirit in such a way that we're all encouraged, but yet it it doesn't fulfill its purpose. So Jesus spoke, "I want to give the Holy Spirit, and it's going to." make you, and give you power to be witnesses, he married that then with the harvest on the, the day that it comes to always speak to us that when the Holy Spirit comes, the purpose of it is that the truth of God may be revealed, not just to the believer, because we have the Holy Spirit, but to the unbeliever. The Holy Spirit comes and he empowers us to be a witness, not just among the believers where we're in a closed door and we, and we have everybody enjoys us, but when there's a real and, um, real and imminent danger around us, the Holy Spirit is the one that empowers us to speak truth, empowers us to live for Him. The witness there, it's not just what is revealed, what we see, but then what we speak, what we share. So it's not just a, a free dinner that we gave last night, but it's now the opportunity that we have our neighbor down below us, Christine, invited us over. I won't be sipping wine, but she invited us over for wine so we could talk more about Jesus. You know, the neighbor down the hall, Sylvia, um, Chinese girl, she's like, I, I know about the Bible, I want, I'm not a follower of Jesus, but I want to know more about the Bible, can I come to your Bible study? Sure. Like, so it, 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 it's not just, 
if we stay with just the acts of kindness um, that reveal the love of the Father, I believe that's true. The, our acts of kindness reveal the love of the Father. It says that you know that, they'll know that you're my disciples because of the love that you have for one another. So we know that it's the love. But then the Spirit then enables us to speak the truth in the moment of an act of service. When I took the, when I took the college kids down to State Street for the um, Freak Fest event, it wasn't just the handing out of free, we weren't just there to hand out free, co uh, free hot cocoa, which we did, and people were blessed, and they were like, why are you guys giving away this free hot cocoa? If it just stopped at the act of kindness, oh, because we love you, I think we wouldn't have um, been able to, that we weren't fulfilling the purpose in which the Holy Spirit sent us there. So it wasn't just the act of kindness, here's a hot cocoa, but then the explanation of truth. Hey, we're giving this free gift away because we've received a free gift that we didn't deserve. And we're here tonight just to love you because we've received the love of the Father. And revealing to them that Jesus is the reason why we live. The Holy Spirit enables us to be a witness. So as I read, as I, we we'll see here in verse, um, in Acts chapter 2, I'm going to read 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together at one place, and suddenly, like a blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed like tongues of fire that separated on them to the rest of, and to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Peter was one of those in that upper room that was, that was praying and was united together. And when he was praying, the, 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 um, the Spirit of God was poured out on the day of Pentecost, the day representing harvest. And we see Peter, maybe the same, maybe he has a little bit of the same personality, maybe the same characteristics, standing before everybody in, in verse 14. But this time when he speaks, he's not just speaking out of his mind, he's not just um, speaking on his own accord, he's this foot and mouth disease has totally left Peter. But he speaks with boldness and declares to the Jews that are all standing around him, that are there celebrating this feast, that they're the one that crucified Jesus. And that they need to repent. Now this is, this is crazy. This, this cause, this can be a cause for stoning. This is like, this is causing of disruption. This is, this is not a, something that you would just normally stand up in front of a huge crowd that's accusing you of being drunk and do, unless it was the Holy Spirit that empowered him. And when he opened his mouth that day, instead of being the normal Peter that got all of his words wrong, he spoke a sermon in such a way that it pierced through their hearts and they were convicted to the place that they, 30,000 of them were baptized and added to their number that day. So the Holy Spirit, he, he takes what is our ordinary personality, our ordinary person, and he he makes it exponentially more like Jesus. The word there in, um, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the word power, you receive power, it's actually the word dunamis, it's like a dynamite. So it takes, he takes what's already ours and he explodes it, he expands it to be able to be like Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes upon us and he gives us his power, he gives us dunamis power to be a witness. And we see this direct correlation. Peter was a man that, that would always would say the wrong thing, would do the wrong thing, he would, he's a little uh, confused at times with Jesus when he's interacting with them, but now the Holy Spirit comes upon him and everything lines up. The, re the revelation of who Jesus is lines up with his ability to, to speak with boldness, and he delivers this message that people get saved, he will turn their lives on. And this morning I want to encourage us as we continue to look at the Holy Spirit, that that same Holy Spirit that came upon the disciples uh, Peter, Peter speaks of the prophecy. It says that it is for all, both men and for women, who will pour out the Spirit in those days. I will show wonders in heavens above and signs on earth below, blood and fire and build of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This later that he repeats David, he says, I saw the Lord, and he sits behind him, because he is at the right hand, and I will, and I will not be shaken. He will not be shaken. Verse 39, it says, this promise is for you and your children 
and all who are afar off, for all who the Lord God will call. It's for all of us. The Holy Spirit is for all of us. To get to salvation is for all of us. And this story, maybe you've visited and been in a church before, that they would say that this has ceased or stopped. But this prophecy of Joel continues for all generations. It was passed down to the disciples, which they passed down to the first converts, which they passed down to the next convert, next converts. Now, 2,000 plus years later, we can again call upon the Lord and receive the power of His Holy Spirit that we may too stand up and be witnesses no matter where we are, in our, in our job location, in our family, in our neighborhood, in our school, that we attend in, in any situation. The Holy Spirit is there that we may reveal truth. You know, we talk about uh, sometimes in America we have it easy where we don't have to face hard times or hard, difficult things. Or, you know, uh, and I look around the world and I say, you know, I've never, I've never truly had a fear for my life in, when I'm when I'm sharing my faith. And I think sometimes because of that, maybe we we have regulated the Holy Spirit just to that other person. But the Holy Spirit is somebody for us today to give us the power to speak in any situation. To be able to be counter, uh, be counter culture in the, in, within the midst of culture. Jesus didn't call us to be separate, to be holy and set apart. He, he, we are set apart within the culture. He didn't say take them out of the world, but he said leave them in the world and give them power within the world. And that's our opportunity. This morning, I would like to pray with you, and um, let's uh, let's um, and we're going to. I'm going to ask that we would all close your eyes in a moment, and, and I want to pray and ask um, ask even if you would desire to receive the Holy Spirit this morning, that you would desire. Say, I need this Holy Spirit. I can identify sometimes with Peter. I, I get things wrong. I, I maybe even admit that I, I deny Christ in certain situations. There's opportunities I have in, in people's life to to stand up for Christ, to stand up for truth, and. Sometimes I don't take those moments. Sometimes I shy away from it. Sometimes I, I close my mouth. And sometimes I, I, I'm in fear of opening my mouth. Jesus said, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit so that when you open your mouth, it be the Spirit of God that speaks. So if that's you this morning, if you say, Andrew, I, I recognize this morning I need the Holy Spirit. I want to be... I want to be so full of the Holy Spirit that my life is transformed. That everything I do, everything I say, that I that I no longer fear in certain situations, that, that what people will think or what people will do. I want to live my life as a witness. I want to live my life. I want my, my times at lunch. I want my home to be a place of witness. I want my place at time at work to be a place of witness. I want to be bold because of the Holy Spirit. If that's you this morning, I would ask that uh, you would raise a hand. And as raising a hand, that's, a, that's going to be a sign to the Father that you desire this. The, the Word says that if we have a good Father that loves to give good gifts, how much more would He give to us the Holy Spirit? All it takes is to ask, ask the Father for the Spirit. And He's going to give it to us. He desires this for us. So that's you this morning. I, I just raise a hand. And as you raise a hand, it's not just to, so I recognize it, but it's just, it's to the Father. Say, Father, I need this. I want this. I want your Holy Spirit.
may be a witness full of power. That may be a witness full of truth. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're here with us in this moment. Pray that you would come and flood us. Flood us that our lives be full of Jesus. Flood us, Holy Spirit, we would be full of truth. Flood us, Holy Spirit, that we would be that our tongues would be released to speak. Jesus' name. 